Our speaker today is Max Label. Max is a policy and strategic communications specialist. He graduated from Lawrence University with a degree in government and Russian studies, and then pursued a master's degree in law and diplomacy, international communication, and US foreign policy at the Fletcher School at Tufts University. Max works at, worked at a communications specialist on several political campaigns in Wisconsin before moving to the East Coast where he works in policy and strategic communications. I first heard Max speak on a panel a couple of months ago organized by our mutual alma mater, Lawrence University, and Max spoke about misinformation and disinformation as a tool of warfare. And I'd been looking for some time for somebody to speak to us about misinformation. And when I heard him talk that day, I knew right away that I had finally found the person I was looking for. <coughs> so Max is going to talk to us about misinformation and disinformation and why we should not call it fake news, which he explained very clearly to me when I first reached out to him and how we uh, can avoid falling into the trap and being manipulated by these nefarious messages. I asked him to focus on domestic issues with respect to misinformation and disinformation because of the DA position on not discussing foreign affairs as much as we'd all like to. So, um, and also say that Max's views today are strictly his own and do not re represent those of his employer. So Max, over to you. Thank you so much for the warm introduction. It is a pleasure to be here. I'm really looking forward to discussing this with all of you. Give me a moment as I pop my slides up. Um, let's see, let's get this presentation up. There we go. Can everyone see my screen clearly? Yes, yes, we can. Perfect, thank you. Um, so today it's really to talk about combating disinformation and misinformation. And this is my bread and butter um, in my current work. And also I had an opportunity to engage in the misinformation, disinformation space when I was involved in a couple of different campaigns, at the state level in Wisconsin. Um, because unfortunately, though it's typically been a Disinformation and misinformation has typically been codified as coming from an external threat actor or foreign adversary. We're now seeing it more and more happen from domestic actors too. So today I, I hope we can cover just what it is, um, the so what, why it matters to us, what the ramifications and consequences are of perpetuating misinformation and disinformation, and then the now hope we can walk away with a sense of what can be done at individual level, but also societal level. And there will be hopefully plenty of time for conversation and questions at the end as well. So I like to start off um, usually when I'm kind of giving a recap over disinformation in general, I start with this juxtaposition. Um, of course, disinformation is a, it's a cognate for disinformatia, um, a Russian word that became popularized under the Soviet Union during the Cold War when the Soviet Union became notorious for spreading false information um, about the United States through U.S. conduits. But it exists and has existed well, well before um, the Cold War. So Ben Franklin, pictured on the left, actually it was a, a, an ex-wielder of disinformation himself one time when he was representing the United States in Paris uh, in 1782. He actually published uh, a fake article, um, completely, completely false, um, but published an article in a, a real paper alleging that the British had paid um, American Indians to scalp Americans on the frontier. And it was malinformation, completely false, intended to cause harm um, to the British, sway European allies to the side of the US and galvanize support um, with the American state side. 
And then fast forward to today, um, you might see pictured the Internet Research Agency, which if, if you followed some of the disinformation coverage around the 2016 election, it's notorious housing um, it was referred to as a troll farm where agents would go and post social media that was fake um, in an, an effort to sow discord in, in the wake of the 2016 election. So I, I like this juxtaposition because it shows how long this information, misinformation has been around, how it's still around, how it's going to be around for much longer and how it metastasizes now that we're in this new information age where there's so many different ways to get our hands on news and engage with the media. So starting with just definitions, um, because sometimes disinformation and misinformation are used interchangeably. Um, and they're not quite the same thing. So misinformation refers to just false information, but not necessarily an intent to do harm. This is like your Uncle Mo shares something about the moon landing uh, being staged or about vaccines potentially causing cancer and fertility. They aren't fully informed and they aren't trying to do harm to a given community. They're trying, they're trying their best to share what they think is truth. Um, malinformation, intent to harm. Uh, so think of when I'm on campaigns, I think of opposition research. So say a candidate hasn't paid any income taxes. That's pushing out information revealing that they may have done something wrong that's factually correct with an intent to stymie that, that person's campaign. And then the nexus of malinformation and misinformation is where we got disinformation, where we see it could be a state actor, a non-state actor, foreign or domestic, putting out a narrative that is knowingly false with an intent to sow discord. Um, disrupt, dismay, or deny. Uh, and we're going to mostly focus on the domestic aspect. Traditionally, it's been foreign adversaries, but very much can exist in a domestic context too. And I like this graphic. This is from the Department of Defense um, in 2001, because it's simple, overly simple. It's a very old way, old lens for viewing disinformation. Um, and it goes to show just how much more evolved we've become in, in engaging with this issue. This graphic is totally set up to just deal with a foreign adversary who would be placing disinformation um, as a type of intelligence operation using a covert press placement uh, and then trying to get that article or story fun in sympathetic papers or publications and eventually seeing it replayed on state media and then U.S. mainstream media picking it up. This is a somewhat antiquated lens as we'll see in the next slide because the landscape has become much more complex. Um, this is a Department of Homeland Security's graphic for assessing a disinformation what they call a kill chain, uh, the process that uh, an entity might go through when sowing disinformation. And again, this can comply, apply to a domestic actor as well as a foreign adversary. So it involves that reconnaissance phase at the beginning. It's pushing out disinformation that plays upon already identified pre-existing fissures in a society, society, what people are pre-programmed to believe, finding what colors people's worldviews, and then pulling on that thread, and then building a story accordingly and launching a campaign from their desired conduits. So picking you know, reliable journalists, trusted journalists, uh, podcasters, bloggers, people that are in your initial disinformation network who reliably put the content out there for you. What? And then 
the fertilization oh, phase comes from seeing that story copied, repeated. The idea that the more an audience is exposed to something, the more and more people will start to believe it. Okay, copies of all investment account it. statements. Okay. Jennifer Hill, could you please mute? Thank you. And then amplifying just by means of relying on others in your network. It could be now we see bots on social media, fake Twitter accounts, fake Facebook accounts, continuing to repost, reshare, um, and then even seeing um, media aggregators just repost the same story over and over again. Uh, we see that as well. So it the story would gain more traction, more hits. And then that manipulation phase just involves splicing additional granularity and nuance into the narrative. The best way to keep a story in the headlines, if even if it's a true story, is just adding additional bits of intrigue and ideas to it that will cause people to keep on clicking and keep eyes and ears on the narrative. And then finally, it's with an end goal in mind to change behavior of a group, a targeted group or community. And it's a complex, long process. Steps are sometimes removed by um, domestic and foreign actors, depending on the level of complexity that they wish to engage at, but it can be um, dangerous for how the effects play out um, in our society. So looking at some of the ramifications, the so what, um, I think I'll bring our attention to, these are two graphics showing public sentiment around two issues directly related to disinformation and misinformation. So the belief that there was widespread voter fraud in 2020, we can think of this, conceptualize this as a direct result of domestic disinformation. Um, it's abundantly clear um, that there wasn't widespread voter fraud in 2020 yet. As I'm sure many of us are familiar, there's a, nearly a third of the electorate uh, believing that there was some horrible flaw with the 2020 presidential election. Nearly 70% of Republicans, 75% of those who voted for former President Trump and that's largely due to disinformation networks pushing out a narrative that the election was rigged in some manner um, or stolen. And we see consequences of disinformation, not just in societal perception of an election, but those turn kinetic on January 6th when you see people actually taking up arms, trying to storm the Capitol and, and change, um, change the electoral outcome in favor of former President Donald Trump. And then on, on the right, uh, these are some polling figures related to vaccine hesitancy. Um, and vaccine hesitancy doesn't necessarily um, only originate from disinformation or misinformation. It's an issue where if you look at some of the groups like Black Americans, for example, there are understandable reasons why African Americans might have an inherent skepticism um, uh, uh, of vaccines because of a history of medical malpractice targeting um, African Americans in the United States. However, it's important to understand that because of those predispositions, groups become more susceptible to misinformation and disinformation. Um, so we've seen disinformation with foreign adversaries actually pumping social media, namely Twitter, full of false information about COVID vaccines. But we've also seen um, internal domestic actors spreading falsehoods um, and completely misrepresenting realities of the vaccine. And this plays out not just 
resulting in vaccine hesitancy, but resulting in real public health consequences as we try and mitigate COVID-19 as a pandemic and try and get a critical mass of the population vaccinated. So those are two important examples that are timely when, when looking at disinformation um, and misinformation and still unclear how they're going to play out. So when it comes to stopping curtailing disinformation at a societal level, I won't purport to have a policy solution um, that's clean or clear. It's an incredibly wicked problem. And it's one that likely won't go away. Um, why I showed those two stories, Ben Franklin and the Internet Research Agency, it, disinformation and misinformation have pretty much been around as long as human language has been around. And they likely will continue to persist. But it's a problem that still urgently needs to be addressed now that we have new media channels and can be addressed and at least curbed, if not completely prevented. So some options I've seen from different governments trying to put an end to disinformation and misinformation comes in the form of censorship or crackdowns, um, namely China uh, using really intense internet censorship has in their view been able to completely eliminate um, disinformation, misinformation, any false media narratives. But having personally lived behind the Great Firewall, it's frustrating when you don't have unfettered access to information and when you don't have access to all of your apps and media sites. And then it's the government deciding how to divine what truth is. Um, and ultimately, I can say for my time living in China, you're not getting a full, a full holistic picture. Um, Media literacy campaigns are often floated as a quick, simple fix if we could only just educate more of the public. And it's a, it's a quandary to do this because would it be done at a governmental level? Would the federal government be deciding the campaigns? Would it be done at a local level, um, district to district? It's been difficult to, difficult to get a consensus. Um, for how you would implement a standardized media literacy effort or education system, but certainly one that we could benefit from. And then legislation, there's been um, some legislative pushes in the United States. I think of the Honest Ads campaign, for example, um, where legislators were really honing in on ads forwarding false information on Twitter and Facebook. And it led to a brief ban in ads on, on both of those platforms, at least when I was running campaigns. Um, and it's a patchwork uh, solution because false information still gets out and otherwise and false ads were a huge problem, especially in 2016, but there's, plenty of room for debate and discourse on the scope of that legislation and how you could actually scale it to address such a such a massive issue. And then fact checking, labeling, I'm sure for those that have Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, you see the false information banners that pop up um, underneath posts or little eyes for additional information. You or COVID-19 resources, you can click here. Those I think are completely necessary, but difficult to implement, especially because some social media companies are run by people. Um, for example, Jack Dorsey, former um, president of Twitter himself has retweeted disinformation um, or misinformation, both actually um, over a dozen times. So sometimes even the leadership of these companies are susceptible to falling for these issues. Um, so it's hard to put them in charge as the sole arbiter of fact-checking. 
and I put uh, pointer.org down there as a, as a resource because they do a great job researching and trying to stay up to date on how governments, different governments, both autocratic and democratic, have tried to combat, curtail um, disinformation and misinformation in their respective media ecosystems. So we look at the individual level. These seem like simple steps, but I find that in our very busy days, many of us don't always take them and many people aren't always media literate in this manner especially when we can share things on social media so quickly with the click of, click of a button. People don't always check sources. Reading the full article and checking the source just as the first step is crucial. But oftentimes, at least on my Twitter feed from what I'm looking at, many people do not, um, definitely don't. Lateral reading just meaning as long as you're consuming media across a variety of channels, um, on whatever topic it may be, you'll be much better informed and will be able to suss out what information is completely fake or completely outside of the norm of reporting. And then carefully correcting misinformation. So when your uncle Mo posts stuff about the moon landing, about vaccines, rather than resharing it, um, with like a comment about how crazy it might be. Um, that, that, that's something to avoid because it inadvertently forwards the narrative to more eyeballs, just posting a fact check from PolitiFact or another fact checking website is typically advised because even though it might not change your uncle's mind immediately, it is helpful for other viewers um, of his post on his timeline. And then there's the idea concept of pre-bunking versus debunking. Debunking being you're trying to disprove something after the fact, but pre-bunking, we want to focus on inoculating ourselves to disinformation and misinformation before we're actually viewing it. So going through the necessary media literacy training, doing all that lateral reading, staying up to date from a variety of healthy media sources. Um, making sure that media consumption has been grown and instilled in that's starting from a student level. And it's, it's difficult to get into those habits sometimes as, as we get older and older and hard to break out of them, especially if people become siloed in a belief system that they really don't want to, to shirk. So a few more tools, which I, I really hope you will take the time to check out because I think they're, they're fantastic um, to put into your personal arsenals for dealing with disinformation and misinformation. The first two are games, Spot the Deep Fake and BadNews.com. They're excellent resources for educating people about misinformation and disinformation. Um, about the deepfake, especially dealing with deepfakes, videos that are altered to look like they're actual depictions of a person that are in fact fake. There have been some circulated of Nancy Pelosi, for example, making her appear inebriated um, to try and you know damage her, her character or show that she's ill fit for office. So th and those are going to become more common. So I wholly recommend trying out the game. Badnews.com is great for high school students, college students, grad students. Um, a great tool for starting the training on media literacy. EU versus Disinfo is an amazing, um, amazing resource, though they mainly track, um, they, they, they track across 15 different languages um, and mainly track what they report to be uh, Kremlin, Kremlin aligned disinformation campaigns. Uh, Bot Sentinel is a browser extension and a website where if you're on Twitter, you can grab any suspicious handles and check it on Bot Sentinel and they'll be able to use big data to analyze 
how this user has been posting, what they're posting about, at what rate, when they're posting, take all of this data and be able to assess whether it might be a bot or not, whether it might just be an automated account. Global Disinformation Index is similar to EU versus Disinfo, a massive repository of uh, disinformation campaigns and studies related to disinformation. And then Hamilton 2.0, I really love this tool. It's a, it's a fantastic real-time um, tool from the Alliance for Securing Democracy that deals with the live snapshot of what disinformation and misinformation campaigns and narratives are taking root today. And it's, it's excellent. I still will check it um, pretty consistently. And finally, the factual. It's a browser extension and a website which will be able to analyze some of the media that you're reading. And it provides a score and overview of articles based on the source, the sourcing. Uh, it gives a history of the journalist's particular bias or tint, whether it's towards a particular state or political party. And it, it does the same thing for the media outlet in question. And sometimes can, it can even provide a few additional you know, resources, details, specifics relating to that particular narrative that you might be reading about. It's a really, really useful tool. So I, I hope you can walk away with some of these and implement them into your personal media consumption methods. But I don't purport to have all the answers on this. It's a very difficult thorny topic, but hopefully we walk away with some more skills in hand. And with that, I'm, I'm happy to take some time for conversation and questions. Thank you, Max. That was really interesting. Um, Jackie says, she's put a comment, badnews.com doesn't exist. It looks like it should be getbadnews.com. Does that sound like? That, that might be the case. I was just on it recently. It might be getbadnews.com. I don't want to inadvertently send you to any suspect websites. So, um, I'll, I'll double check that one. Okay. Um, another, it, come, come to think of it, um, the RAND Corporation does a great job of, they actually compile a bunch of these different tools. So if you go through the RAND Corporation's of disinformation, combating disinformation toolkit list, I think you'd be able to find the badnews.com or getbadnews.com on that um, on that aggregated aggregated list. That's RAND R E N D. Yeah. Thank you. I have there was something that you said about um, pre-buffing? No, pre-bunking. That made me think, you know, they that you hear the saying that the a lie is halfway around the world while the truth is still putting on its shoes. And I had wanted to ask you about, yeah, what, how we can react more quickly or what we can do to be on top of um, misinformation, not, not just resharing and avoiding resharing, but actually to like, to inoculate people ahead of time so that they're not even receptive. Right. It's, it's a challenge with, with pre-bunking because part of it is just ensuring people get the needed media literacy that so many people are lacking um, and ensuring that that's a part of curricula and, and a part of people's media consumption learning curve. But then when it comes to uh, pre-bunking on stories that might become disinformation we, we try to anticipate, um, at least we went both when I was working on campaigns and in, in my current work now, it, it's trying to anticipate what people might try to spin off next as a conspiracy, um, what people might try and push next 
relating to disinformation. And it means putting out a consistent and quality grip of the truth related to that specific topic or issue. So COVID-19, it's in COVID-19 vaccines, it's almost too late to be doing some of the debunking around vaccine skepticism and hesitancy when the pandemic already hits. So some of these essential public health measures, it's a reminder that you need a constant steady drip of positive, correct, factual information beforehand in preparation for when a crisis does hit. Right. Wendy Hunter Roberts has a question. Please. Hunter, I think you're on mute. There we are. <laughs> Better. And I just turned my video on, but I don't see it, but that's fine. I don't care. Um, hi. Um, one of the problems I've had with this over the last couple of years is on the rare occasion that I attempt to engage with somebody who is spreading disinformation or misinformation, typically what I will do is I will look at one of my trusted um, websites like PolitiFact, for example, um, and, and do a fact check. And invariably they come back with, oh, well, that's not, PolitiFact is funded by the CIA or something like that. So I'm trying to find, it probably wouldn't matter, but the funding agency for each of these um, fact-checking organizations because a lot of people seem to think that a lot of these fact-checking organizations are in and of themselves not factual and are biased and are being funded by people who have particular political agendas that are antithetical to theirs. What Definitely. Definitely. Um, Certainly. I, I run into that all the time too. To tear my hair out. <laughs> right. 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 Because it's a easy tactic of any person engaging in disinformation or unknowingly spreading misinformation to just deny. Just deny. They don't need to have their response rooted in truth or fact they're already messaging because they're predisposed to mistrust, distrust of government agencies and to media entities. Um, and you bring up like um, trust is decayed in government and yeah. trust is decayed in the media in major ways. And so you're not necessarily going to change that particular person's mind in a social media exchange. It's right. an unfortunate, reality that we have to live with that you don't necessarily change an individual's mind through that direct engagement however it's still important to post that fact check to post that little piece of information that corrects whatever inaccuracy may be being spread because it's still visible for others on social media too so as frustrating as it may be when, when you engage with people who declare that PolitiFact is funded by the CIA or George Soros, you won't change their minds, but you at least will lift a haze for other people who are reading and engaging with the information. Let me ask you if I can do a follow-up question. Please. Are, are, do we have a list is there somewhere a list that I could find? Like I used to use Snopes and then I was told, okay. no, Snopes had been bought by, I don't remember whom. And and it all gets, I mean, I, I believe PolitiFact or it might be factcheck.org. It might be factcheck.org. Used to be um, a, a branch and funded by the St. Petersburg Times. And I happen to have family in St. Petersburg, Florida, so I know the St. Petersburg Times well. And it was one of the last 
independent, family-owned newspapers. And it was a source that I actually really, really did trust. Um, and so anything that was, you know, an outgrowth of them, I felt really good about. But now they've been bought, finally, unfortunately. And I don't know who owns what anymore. Is there someplace I could find that out? So oh, first off, I love St. Petersburg, Florida. We'll be down there in a few months to visit my um, aunt and uncle who retired there. Lovely place. And second, unfortunately, there isn't a master list of uh, that has disentangled the financial networks behind different media enterprises. I wish there was a, a cleaner cut one but as far as how we can unlock who funds and, and finances media networks, it's typically done by self sleuthing. And I don't know off the top of my head any pretty good network um, or list for, for finding out who funds what. But individually, you are able to take a look at who ownership might be. It's these are new organizations typically have to have that information readily available for their viewers and consumers. Um, and you're never going to have a completely unbiased source too. That's the important to remember. Sources, media sources as hard as it is to, to swallow because we all want kind of that divine beacon of truth that we can trust. Everyone has a different slant, a different bias based on whatever upbringing or presuppositions they might hold. So the best way to combat that is having the balanced media diet and reading laterally, having a couple of different sources in play that are trusted, that may have slightly differing points of view. Yeah, I'm sorry I can't point you to a more clear tool for when it comes to financing media. That's something that I'll look into, and I'm sure some of my colleagues might have more information than I can, I can follow up after as well. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa Berger has a question. Please. Okay. Hello. Hello. Thanks for your, the, all this information. I've taken notes. And one thing I want to say, you talked about, like, uh, I forget the term you used, but it was like reliable sources or trusted sources. I mean, I would say journalistic sources, because that is to me the difference that somebody who's a professional is going out and checking their sources and things. And so, um, I mean, I would say like, even like a news agency like AP, is more maybe neutral than let's say a government source like BBC or American source that has its bias like like you said of their upbringing CBS news depending on what the story is I get some news from away from the place where the event is happening but I wanted to ask you about what's going on with um, Elon Musk who's trying to take over Twitter and in the name of free you know getting back free speech and not um, what he called censoring people. So that would mean maybe giving um, Trump back his account. I mean, it's really scary to think that <laughs> we're going to go backwards again. So I just wanted to know if you could, I, I actually don't use Twitter because um, I have enough with uh, journalistic sources myself, but I know that other people do. So I just, I'm concerned and I know it goes into the news cycle. So I wanted to hear what you thought about what's going on. <laughs> Definitely. And good for you for not using Twitter. If I could get away with living the rest of my life without it, I think I would be a lot happier and, you know, emotionally just a lot better off. But I, I use Twitter because um, it's a way to get access to information quicker, albeit the risk being the information usually comes delivered in a much more charged way and much more susceptible to false information because of the speed it 
which it's moving and isn't not necess isn't necessarily verified. So when it comes to Elon Musk wanting to purchase Twitter outright and reinstill the values of free speech, have it be an open platform. Um, it's a it's a difficult question that I don't think I'm personally equipped to weigh in as to whether or not Twitter should be a free for all platform for those to express any views that they that they might have or might not. I don't know if Elon Musk is doing this solely based on First Amendment uh, motivations. I think there's certainly business calculations and branding calculations in mind when he pursues this sort of dealing. I, in the past, Elon Musk and Tesla have tried to shut down other accounts that disparage Tesla or disparage Mr. Musk directly. Um, so I, I don't believe he's always been a pure champion of First Amendment and fair, free, open conversation. When it, when it comes to deplatforming politicians like former President Trump, it puts us in a, in a quandary as to whether or not Twitter is truly a, a public, public square or it's a resource that should be gatekept or behind closed doors. And that question of who gets to do the gatekeeping is a concerning one um, for many because I don't know if the government is best equipped to handle it. Um, there are governments that try to handle it in other countries and it turns more into censorship and the state party line than a free and fair discourse, open discourse. And if you allow it to become too open and unregulated, like some of these other sites like uh, Rambler or Telegram, you get really nasty and dangerous, um, dangerous information on there. As far as where this shakes out, I, I think Twitter is probably going to try to put up a wall uh, prevents Musk from going further with those business dealings because it might cause some problems with the bulk of its user base who probably share some of your opinions on the issue. I'm sorry I can't answer it cleanly because it is really a dilemma of our time. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to say that I've worked as a fact checker um, for National Geographic uh, Television. And so that uh, job consisted of uh, looking at documentaries that they acquired and seeing if um, everything they said in the documentary was true based on two independent, different sources. And those sources had to be either published books, which don't necessarily tell the truth, but okay, that's accepted, or like BBC or some source. So I've kind of, it's, it's a good um, job to have to get you in the habit of fact-checking. <laughs> so I... Uh, of course, I think that department has now been um, removed from National Geographic. They, it's very expensive standards and um, operations, I think it was called. But um, also, I just wanted to comment if I could, if there's, I don't see any more hands up right now. Um, one thing you mentioned is um, about how 30% of voters in total um, believe that the election was stolen and of that 30%, 60% were Republicans, and I don't know how many voted for Trump. But the way it's, that is framed, it seems like, oh my God, that's terrible. But the, real, the reality is 70% of people are happy and they believe that the system worked. So I think that a lot of what's going on in public discourse is, is scaring people by saying, you know, putting out information that's, oh my God, there are so many people believe that the election was stolen, but really it's a minority. It's at 30% is not even near 50%. So they should just not get a lot of exposure and we shouldn't be talking about them. I mean, we could talk about them, you and I, you know, here, but not 
amplifying mm -hmm. it, putting it in the CBS, CBS shouldn't be talking about that so much, I think. Right. Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult point to engage with because when it comes to measuring the health of a democracy, you would ideally, you want all the citizenry to trust and believe in these uh, institutions. Um, and when it plays out, continues to play out in a way that you have a minority, even if a, a third of the electorate, still a significant chunk of the electorate pointing to, hey, this is rigged, hey, this is fraudulent. The fear is that it might spread and the fear is that it might become a tactic that can become just implemented over and over again. And it'll have a degrading effect on democracy. I've seen it implemented again in Wisconsin from personal experience where people try to push the idea that, hey, this election is false, fraudulent, the rules are too loose, it's not a legitimate election. And like you've said, thankfully, it's not, we're not necessarily seeing it take root in a larger way. There also, after um, Gavin Newsom's victory in, in California, we saw, um, you know, attempts to claim that that election was rigged, but eventually kind of dropped and withers away. So the hope is, the hope is, and this is kind of a, a time will tell question. The hope is that if it's not given too much air and if you definitively show these claims for what they are, it's just complete distortions of reality, that that minority will eventually have to listen to have to listen to some reason that the politicians that push the, those disinformation campaigns that elections were rigged or fraudulent will see diminishing returns and the incentive to lie about election outcomes will be removed. Like if the tactic doesn't work, why would you why would you use it? That's the hope, but it's a time will tell question. Uh, if I don't see anybody else with their hand up, so I'm going to ask another question. Um, what What do you see as like the dominant disinformation themes being changed or being you know shared the most right now? What's What's trending? What What is and what is potentially most damaging for Democrats in this year's elections? For Democrats in this year's election, um, so caveat that. Professionally, most of what I focus on is typically um, state on state disinformation. Um, that being said, it can still be picked up by domestic actors who might think, oh, oh, that's like a nice disinformation campaign you've got there. I might repurpose it for myself. For Democratic candidates, I am deeply disconcerted by a rise of Republicans leveraging sexual predation against minors as a tactic, using language around grooming and, and invoking these QAnon conspiracy theories, drawing tacit links to some QAnon conspiracy theories about like, Democrats being a cabal of child traffickers. Um, concerned because I've seen a couple of Congress people on the right forward those kinds of narratives. Um, I saw candidates in Wisconsin make those kind of signals. And that's not, I guess I distinguish between, there's definitely a difference between promoting you know, protection of children which some candidates do, but others have crossed a line into making assertions, suppositions that Democrats somehow are connected to Hunter Biden, who's somehow connected to 
you know, child tra trafficking or other heinous crimes against children. So that's one that I'm, I'm really concerned about um, seeing because it's a really ugly, ugly theme that might play out. And I, I'd also be concerned about um, COVID origin questions, especially as people grow tired, public seems to be growing more tired of public health mandates, mask mandates. You might see um, more drawn out theories, which some fringe conservative sites have pushed about. And Anthony Fauci, Dr. Tony Fauci helped fund COVID in Wuhan. We've seen um, Tucker Carlson forwarding ideas about the US, Hunter Biden funding um, bio labs in Ukraine, which may have been experimenting with coronaviruses and bats. And you know, those are those conspiracies are real sweet spots. You know, Democrats were somehow involved in creation of COVID so that they could lock everyone down, take away your freedoms. And you know, now they're trying to cover it up and also throw in Hunter Biden being involved in some way. And it really ticks all the boxes for conspiratorial Mad Libs. Those are the two that I've, I've seen a lot of recently. Okay, okay. thanks. <laughs> Doris, yeah. Doris Stanger has a question. Yeah, hi. Um, this is kind of related to what you're just talking about. Um, it seems that although the Biden administration is doing great things, it, it, there, that information is being buried in, in the news. Um, I'm a big New York Times fan. Um, National Public Radio, those are my two sources. And even they seem to be honing in on the negative inflation as opposed to the positive job growth. And I'm wondering if you think that the media, which has gotten a lot of bad press from the Trump administration and all the right wing theorists, you know, conspiracy theorists, mm -hmm. are being extra careful not to overpraise the Democrats because they were so hard on Trump. Um, any, 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 any comments on that? Sure, sure. Difficult for, I, I don't maintain close contact with journalists who are covering um, the president closely. I wish I did, but I don't. So I can't quite get into their heads. But if I were to speculate, I would imagine that part of this is, yes, a, a swing back, a reaction to Trump. There was there were heightened levels of scrutiny for good reason during the Trump presidency. Um, and there's definitely an effort to maintain that, to ensure that no one can cry, cry out that there's biases, like a, a liberal biases existing in the media. Um, also, I, I offer that President Biden himself can be a bit cantankerous with journalists, um, not to the same extent as former President Trump, but there's certainly been instances of interpersonal friction um, that likely contribute to some of, the, some of that coverage. Um, I, I can think of like one incident with um, Peter Ducey, for example, using some colorful language and that that's you know that that of interpersonal relationship especially in the wake of the trump presidency is going to come under harsher scrutiny but again relative speculation because i'm not in that journalistic seat or not close enough to that journalistic seat right now Thank you. Of course. Okay, well, if there aren't any more questions, I think we'll let Max have the rest of his day back. 
Yes, Lisa says Biden apologized afterwards to Peter Ducey. But, you know, I mean, <laughs> it's just crazy because after the, what the last four years were just constant conflict, now everybody gets all upset about, you know, the, the smallest things. That, that's my own editorializing, I guess. But anyway. <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me. Been a pleasure to speak with you. Um, yes, thank I'm you. I'm following up on that uh, you know, financing piece for Wendy, and I will let you know um, via Annie what I can find out. But thank you all for having me. It was a pleasure to speak with you, and I appreciate all your questions. Thanks so much, Max. Thanks. Have Take a great care. day. Bye. Thank you, you as well.